You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. And welcome to another episode of the RN Mentor Podcast. I'm very excited to have back. Uh, you might actually be, become a frequent flyer at this point, but I'm going to welcome Dr. Ray Walker. Uh, they are uh, an associate professor of nursing, fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and the first nurse inventor to serve as an invention ambassador to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They direct the nursing PhD program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and serve as an associate director of the IALS Center for the Personalized Health Monitoring, a transitional science center specializing in critical analysis and co-creation of AI, sensors, and mHealth. Following service in the U.S. Peace Corps Mali, they completed their nursing training, Ph.D., certificates in nursing education and health inequities, and a postdoctoral fellowships at Johns Hopkins University. Their scholarship focuses on community-directed health innovation and digital defense against harmful tech. Their advocacy for design, justice, and more inclusive invention practices has been featured in magazines such as Forbes, Scientific American, Science, and on NPR. They've consulted on policy for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, White House, United Health, and other industries. They are an active collaborator in the Design Justice Network, co-founder of the Collective Nursing Mutual Aid, and a member of the ANA Innovation Advisory Board. Uh, their children describe them as kind, cute, and big. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Walker. Last time you were here, you were with uh, Dr. Valdez, um, and uh, we were talking about the nursing mutual aid, uh, which uh, which uh, I was so excited to see. And, and I think I shared it with you that actually I assigned it as an assignment to my students to <laughs> to get involved on that day and, you know, give feedback and uh, do some reflective writing exercises on what they heard and what the experience was like. Uh, so that was fantastic uh, uh, for me to uh, observe through Twitter. For those of you who, those of those of the of our listeners that didn't have a chance to join in last year, um, but uh, I want to this time we're going to talk about you, your career, and what you're working with now, which is fantastic. Um, uh, so we'll start with that. So can you share with us, uh, how you got started in the world of nursing and, uh, all sort of take us through the journey of what brought you to where you are today. Wow. Well, thanks. And thanks for bringing up nursing mutual aid. That was just such, um, an incredibly special group of people who came together around that event and who've, I think, been sort of my accountability partners and just just tremendous sources of both support and colleagueship but also wisdom and expertise over the last year or so since that we've been navigating <laughs> this pandemic um dr valdez in particular just um invaluable leader in the field uh for myself nursing was never on my radar growing up, I I grew up in, I, I had a very uh, privileged and, and, and pretty comfortable childhood, and one of my, well, really both sides of my family had both been heavily involved in military service, and um, my parents were not, but sort of every other uncle or 
relation was, and my grandfather happened to be the uh, lieutenant journal, uh, general, and um, at one point, I, I guess it's not the assistant commandant, but sort of the next in charge at uh, 8th and I, the U.S. Marine Corps headquarters in D.C. Oh. So some of my early childhood memories were going to the sunset parades at 8th and I and watching the drill team there um, perform with their sabers flipping in the air and these sort of tree trunk legs of <laughs> marines that would escort you into the stands. I mean, I was probably like five. So I remember sort of tree trunks of like navy clad with the stripe um, uh, uh, belonging to marines who were responsible for, for some of the, the organizing around those parades. And, and just um, at the time feeling like that was what I was going to do. I was going to enter the service at some point. Um, of course, I would be a Marine because that's what my grandfather was. <laughs> <laughs> they were supposedly the, the sort of badasses. Um, and that evolved over the years then into, well, maybe then I'll be a fighter pilot or maybe then I'll uh, do something else in that space. Or I was really fascinated by the Coast Guard and the PJs who serve in the rescue capacity there. But they didn't take women or really anyone who wasn't a, a cis man um, into that service. And once I got to college and was exposed to sort of other possibilities for my career, I also recognized ways in which that could still be an important form of service and then other places maybe I wanted to go with my energy as well. And this was right before we got re-involved in some of the uh, engagements in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, ha I was in college with a bunch of my friends who were there on various scholarships or ROTC or whatever, planning to become officers. And I was enrolled in ROTC courses. Uh -huh. um, and I. And then September 11th occurred, and a lot of things shifted in terms of the United States political stance. Right. And um, I was no longer sure that that was a direction I wanted to go. Um, I, I actually just wasn't sure if I could obey orders. Um, that, that, that's, that's kind of an important part. Yeah, it's sort of a critical part. And I, I, so I applied to the Navy Officer Corps. Okay. Um, and I applied to the Peace Corps. And I got into both in the same week. And I had to make a decision between which way to go. And I actually had the rationale at the time that I could always circle back to a military career later but it might be harder to go the other direction. Uh, so I ended up doing the Peace Corps um, and moving pretty soon after college ended over to uh, Mali, West Africa, uh, and, and being one of the first, I guess they called us HIV AIDS education related volunteers uh, because they had just gotten capacity in that country nationally to test within the previous year before I arrived. Oh, wow. um, and I, I learned a lot through those years of service. I ended up extending my time there slightly to become a trainer of the subsequent group of volunteers. And looking back, I'm both very humbled by the privilege of getting to be there, of, of getting to be part of some of the communities and families that welcomed me in as a sort of outsider during that time. Um, I'm also a little more aware now, too, of my own naivete around the imperialistic aspects of what I was doing, too, um, as an outsider, as an American, as a, a white person, kind of just helicoptering into a space that I really didn't have much familiarity with at all and thinking that I was going to in any way like support that space as opposed to really probably learning far more myself about um, realities outside of my own lived experience. Uh, yeah. And there were all these badass midwives 
who were basically the ones making it work. I, I started in an urban uh, location, which the site had to close down for a couple of reasons, and I was sent to a part of Mali, which is a very large, landlocked, rural country in West Africa, the upper portion of which is the Sahara Desert, and the lower portion is more subtropical. And I was asked to go and open a site that a, sort of no other volunteers had served at before, so you needed to already be familiar with um, some of the local languages. I, I, I spoke Bambara um, and French, which was sort of the official language of business, um, in order to be able to do that. And where I ended up in this very rural setting that was mostly reliant on um, cotton farming as, as income, um, I found myself at a, a health center that served about 14 towns or villages that were like a like a wheels and spokes right around this this central uh, health center and it was staffed by uh, a, a nurse who had been trained by the Malian army and a midwife who had received formal training sort of external to that space and then a series of um, what you might consider more like lay midwives, midwives who'd been trained by those who'd come before them to do that work, and they were the ones providing pretty much all of the health services in that entire region, all the vaccination campaigns, the uh, mother-child care, the emergencies, etc. cetera. Um, wow. And so I just spent like the rest of my years there watching them do what I think one might consider to be, uh, I mean, it was like superpowers. They just, they were so attuned with their assessment skills to like what was going on with the folks they were accompanying in care because the space that we were at was not um, electrified although water was you know, hand-drawn from wells. Um, and so they were really using like their eyes and their ears and their hands and their minds to problem solve and figure out what was needed and then act on that and, and make it work at least 100, I think more than 100 kilometers from any thing we might consider like a, a hospital, which even then, you know, those spaces had some limitations in what they could do as well. So like from a, from the standpoint of someone who was not yet a nurse, but who was being offered the privilege of getting to see care led by nurses and midwives that was effectively grounded in the community and their their own lived experience, which was expertise of like what was needed there. It was it was it was amazing. It was wonderful, and then it also made it that much harder when I came back to the states and actually enrolled in nursing school, and then went and did say like a formal labor and delivery clinical, you know, at a large, fairly well equipped hospital here in the states. It was so hard to sort of accept some of the ways we did things, or I was seeing things done here, because I had seen it done a different way, that yeah. albeit was um, in a space where maybe some resources were limited, but there were these other ways in which resources were not limited insofar as the nurses and midwives truly were practicing it, what you might consider to be like the fullest scope of their potential practice and they were the ones designing in effect the models of care and that as I reflect back on it seems pretty liberating um, when I think about the current landscape too at least here in the United States around debates about scope of practice and the way we have these systems and gatekeeping around who was even allowed to accompany people in care. It's just those those challenges weren't being encountered there because that they were literally the the only line. 
Yeah. Um, and it, and I, I I was naive enough to think that maybe that was like that other places too. And I've I've since learned no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't work like that. <laughs> we don't. Yeah, but but, it, but it made me want to be a nurse because I was like, this 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 is where it's at. I mean, meeting people where it's at, yeah. right where they live, and just being that support and that presence and that holistic kind of approach was so appealing and also so different in some ways from what I had understood a career in say medical care to potentially be. Yeah it just sounds like a such an empowering position to be at um, um, and we we do have a lot of uh, sort of uh, role borders that people try to put up and you know barriers like oh don't cross it and we i'm sure you're you're familiar with with all the stuff we see in social media where various roles are um trying to like sort of lay the land of where their practice stops and other people start and um there's that i i see those debates on twitter around um I should probably not even utter the words because it could start another <laughs> debate. But, you know, debates about what folks are called. And that was another thing. So we were, the, the folks I was observing and, and I guess trying to support in ways that I could, but really, truly the, being the novice myself yeah. and the outsider. Um, they were operating in um, uh, Bambara, uh, w- one of the local languages. And in Bambara, there was really just one word for... A sort of clinical care provider. It was dogatoro, and everyone was dogatoro. I mean, the the midwives were dogatoro. The nurse was dogatoro. If a if a, a physician or someone had come in from the outside, they became dogatoro. And uh, literally, the person who was um, helping to maintain the facility that the health center was in, and who would sometimes take over. There's looser, looser boundaries around roles. So, so this person I, I actually did find on a couple of occasions providing prescriptions to folks um, when the other staff were away. Um, but they too sort of became dogatoro, and it was just the debates around uh, language and titles. Um, I, I won't say they were simpler because I'm an outsider and I can't know, but at least there was less of an easily perceptible division in some ways of, of how power operated in that space. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, I'm always amazed when, I, you know, that's one of the things I'm, 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 I am i i will say I'm privileged enough to have traveled and I'm privileged enough that when I was in the military, that I had an opportunity to do several like humanitarian mesh- missions where it put me in the middle of nowhere and I got to work with some local uh, local folks, and I was always amazed at what they were, what they could do with what little they had. Um, and it always, uh, it was always a humbling experience where um, I would go into, like for example, a small town, and be like, oh my god, you have nothing, I can't do anything, and they would do so much with what they had. Uh, so it is an extremely uh, humbling experience and an awesome learning experience overall. Yeah, and and like from an innovation standpoint too, like I oh, think yeah. for folks. Folks who are problem solving in those environments are just so innovative. Like, and in a way too that I, 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 it causes me to continue to question in some ways the whole premise behind some of those those um, groups that I ended up being there through, like the the Peace Corps. I, 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 I very much appreciated my time in that space, but also like, wow, like. Like that's a lot of hubris to think you're gonna just jump into a space and and like show people how to do something better that they've been problem solving around for for generations before you even arrived. I mean, yeah. I I really was. Um, th- th- there were a lot of good lessons there, and I I don't think those lessons should have come at the expense of um, the folks who um, were my hosts there um i don't think i should justify the continuation of that approach just so that folks like me can learn a lesson or two but in i i do appreciate what it taught me and right. um, yeah i i i agree uh it's uh 
it, it's we probably have a, several shows on that whole concept of where we should and we should where we shouldn't be. Uh, so it's an interesting concept. Um, now you finished your uh, nursing program. Where, where where did you go after that? Well, um, when I came back to the states, Johns Hopkins was recruiting Return to Peace Corps volunteers, mm. and I had it in my head at the time. I hadn't had some of these reckonings, and I was very siloed and naive, I believe, around realities of health and care also right here in the United States. So I had it in my head that I was going to do a MPH NP program and then go back overseas or sort of go back into some type of service or, or nonprofit sort of setting. Um, and through my time in nursing school and also being in Baltimore, which was a, a space I'd never um, lived in before, it was again just a, a series of lessons in both realities of health and um, health, both unmet needs, but also sort of structures driving those unmet needs here, right in my own backyard, right. um, as well as. Uh, I ended up during my final internship for a nursing school working on the bone marrow transplant unit of the cancer center there, which was maybe the polar opposite of anything that I personally planned to do with my clinical training. I mean, it was very acute care. It was a combination of sort of medical, surgical, and, and critical care. It was sometimes very intense and, and depending on what was going on could be very fast paced but also there was a primary nursing model where every person that you were assigned to support you were consistently assigned to those same individuals every time you were working so you got to know people and their families and, and social networks really well and because they spent such a long time on the unit oftentimes you know easily uh, a month and a half to three or more months, depending on the trajectory of care, um, that level of relationship building was something new to me as well. Um, and so by the end of that internship, I'd been offered a job to work on that unit. Um, and it wasn't what I had planned to do, but it occurred to me that probably if I was ever going to get that kind of an experience, in that kind of setting too where there was really good teamwork across the clinical disciplines like they had a model where for the for, for patients where you might consider it to be at the level of critical care the you know typically in an academic teaching center like the residents or the the fellows are sort of rounding and get presenting you know, the case during rounds of the patient but there they actually recognized the intense and sort of intimate knowledge that the nurses had about the individuals we were caring with and for. And so the nurse would lead the presentation during rounds to wow. the medical residents and attending about the status of the patient. And I had never seen that before in other areas of my <laughs> nursing training. It occurred to me maybe this is a little bit rare, at least at the time. Um, and I just loved that they respected not just the nursing knowledge, but but the nursing role and just that that level of presence at the bedside that we know nurses have, um, and the fact that 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 was valuable enough to to center that as the the, the point for for rounding. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, that's still rare. I don't think it happens enough. Um, so that that's amazing that you had an opportunity to work in that environment. Um, how did you decide uh, you were going to go back and further your education and uh, um, eventually get into academia? Um, so I had participated in what you might call a research honors program during my pre-licensure training. It had just started there at Hopkins and I had the 
honor to get to work with Dr. Phyllis Sharps, who um, I would have to meet with at the House of Ruth, which is a, a shelter space that uh, she was providing support to and had been engaged with for, for some time. Um, so she mentored me as I did some, uh, just a very small research project at the, during my pre-licensure training. And I really thought that would be the extent of it. Um, but once I took my job at the cancer center, I was just across the street from the nursing school. And I was still technically enrolled in my sort of dual master's program, but I had said I would defer a year to, to just work full time clinically and try to get a little more experience before diving into another training program. And while I was there on the unit, um, the director of the PhD program at the School of Nursing at the time was calling the unit to ask if I was going to enroll in the PhD program, which I, I don't even know if that's ethical. Like, I'm not quite sure <laughs> thinking back on it. I'm like, how did she do that? But, but somehow, like, she, she, was, she was sending messages to the unit that were more or less just like uh, recruitment efforts because they had, um, they had a, a, a grant at the time that would sponsor the training of folks who were interested in generating nursing knowledge related to addressing health inequities. Um, and it was not what I envisioned doing, but she made a very compelling case that as a BS to PhD student, which is what I would become, and I think I was maybe the third to enter that route at that particular institution, um, you know, I could get I could get a lot of the same training I was hoping to get from the School of Public Health in pursuing you know, a master's, um, but I could also then have this additional sort of mentoring and support to develop my skills in an area that I was already very passionate about. Um, so I was ultimately convinced and I applied to the PhD program and sort of jumped out of my <laughs> dual master's program um, and from there um, had the, the pleasure of working with just several uh, incredible leaders, uh, both both in nursing and also, since it was a pretty interdisciplinary environment, folks from outside of nursing who were engaged in sort of collaborative team team science and um, yeah, so yeah, that's fantastic. Um, there aren't that many opportunities, I think, for people to do something like that. So the fact that you had that opportunity to uh, get involved so early in your career in doing some research and then going into a, that kind of a program with the support system um, sounds ideal. Um, not the route that I took, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, and, and I look back to, I'm like, wow, it, it felt... It was not pre, predestined. Like, I didn't, I didn't have a clear plan, but I'm now even more cognizant of, again, the, the luck, the privilege, like the the fact that those were opportunities even made available to me and even yeah. just the the timing by which they came about um i i do not take for granted and um i like or i i, I want to remain reflexive about the fact that that as you said is not is not always or even often or e even maybe <laughs> rarely <laughs> the case that, that um, but it also you know as someone who came through as a, a, a BS to PhD student I remember because I did maintain my clinical practice while I was in the doctoral program at least for the, the first chunk of it and I remember also hiding my name badge, um, the part that said, because, you know, you update your name badge and it would say PhD student. And I was very aware that I was still very new in nursing and that there were some opinions out there in the nursing space that you, you sort of, at the time, there was a feeling like you, you only get to sort of go back to graduate school once you've earned the right to by putting in your time on the floor. And I, I, so I put surgical tape over the PhD student part of my name badge just to avoid some of those conversations with folks who it seemed 
might disagree with with that as being a valid thing to do. Yeah. Um, and, and it's strange that nursing's like that, that we have so many disciplines in the world that we see people um, go through, P- go and finish their PhD programs in their 20s. And if you do that in nursing, you're like a unicorn, right? You're <laughs> I'm like, what, you didn't do 30 years of nursing before you went to a PhD program or... Um, so I mean, it's it's very it's very strange how, uh, and I think it's part of we're a little on a, on a other side we shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit because now we we do have so many people um, with PhDs, but they get it, you know, like me, I I was in my forties, uh, I still am in my forties, but I I was in my forties by the time you know I got into a PhD program. And uh, so I don't I don't have like I'm not going to have like 40, 50 years of research under my belt by the time I retire. I'm lucky if I'll have 20 years of research under my belt. So um, it's it's and from an academic perspective, uh, you know, we don't have one of the reasons I think we have difficulty having enough uh, uh, nurses in academia as professors and in tenure track positions and things like that. I think uh, it's problematic. Uh, and We do have a. Uh, shortage of of nurses in academia so um well, we could have whole i'm sure you've you've had uh, whole conversations about this <laughs> with others too but I, and it's like we it's it's like a yes and right like we need both like we need folks who have that institutional knowledge and clinical praxis and knowledge of the lived experience of being engaged in care and bringing that into the space of knowledge development, whether that's PhD or DNP or any other spaces that we can think about folks pursuing graduate work in. But but then too, I, I appreciate that folks did not just shut the door on me because I was new, because I'm also not convinced that if, if Dr. Nolan hadn't recruited me off of that floor into a PhD program when she did, that I would have ever found my way back or at least not until, again, much probably later in my career and maybe at a, a time point too when mm. some of the things that I've been given the opportunity to explore and pursue and do would no longer be options. Um, but the first PhD course I ever taught in my role as an assistant professor at UMass, uh, there was a, a, a octogenarian student um, who was trying on PhD study in nursing. And I was also just so delighted by that too. Like, I mean, just the richness that that person's perspective brought to the classroom and to some of the conversations we were having, like for me was also deeply humbling and um yeah i i i I hope that we keep an open mind across the whole trajectory of people's careers about when um we can make these sorts of opportunities accessible yeah definitely uh and i think that's one of the thing uh, i think nursing i don't know if it's done such a great job at and another reason like i have uh this podcast is i want to introduce people to what nurse what nurses are doing sort of across the board and how they have made uh, their sometimes their own niches within the world of nursing. Cause I don't think we've, we've done, I think a poor job as defining what nurses are doing, like not that they can do, but they are already doing. We, we have, we just haven't exposed people. We haven't told people. Um, so I think there's definitely an opportunity for, um, for us to do more of that, um, and then tell people, I'm like, hey, it's not just bedside that we, we see it, even though in media and things like that, that's where we see nursing all the time is, oh, look, it's bedside. They're like, yes, it's bedside, but that's just a part of nursing. And we're so much more than that. And I think that's where people have a hard time understanding. Um, I know when I first got my PhD, uh, people were like, oh, what did you get your PhD in? I'm like, 
nursing. It's a nursing. Re, it's a research PhD. I'm like, but they're like, but you're a, but you're a nurse. I'm like, yes, I understand that. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> you, you are correct on both those accounts. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so I think we just need to, from a professional perspective, we need to do uh, more, um, more education on what nurses are doing already, whether it's in policy work, it's in government, it's in academia, bedside, rural communities, direct patient care, just the whole gamut. There are just so many things. And I'm always learning people doing new cool things. I'm like, oh, I need to talk to them, <laughs> see what they're doing, because I think it's amazing. Yeah, there's so many creative possibilities in nursing. And I think that too is where you mentioned shooting ourselves in the foot earlier. I think, I mean, there are structural barriers to actualizing some of them for various reasons. But there's also that sort of mentality or, or sometimes a certain narrow-mindedness around what is a nurse, who, who, who gets to call themselves that, you know, what's a real nurse, and, and, and then all the, gosh, myriad hierarchies we've created in that space of, you know, who, whose knowledge counts. Um, I'm, I'm working on formalizing a associate's degree to PhD track right now. Oh, wow. For UMass Amherst, in, in part because I've also noticed that, I mean, I'm not only humbled by the nurses who, whatever their practice has been in, in clinical, formal clinical settings, or like you said, in Congress or, or industry or anywhere else, um, I'm, I'm humbled by the ones who've, who've sort of put in a, a career in a space and, and are now coming for you know, their PhD. Um, but I've, I've noticed that among associate degree prepared nurses, there also seems to be um, sometimes just a gap in respect for the knowledge and expertise that ADN nurses possess and who are so critical to the care of so many communities. And I don't actually believe that they should have to get a PhD to get respect, but I do think if we can make a, a, a streamlined and, and accessible way to make that opportunity available and recognize that expertise that they have, that, um, I, 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 I just would love to find any way to, to bring yeah. them even more into some of those spaces that right now seem to continue to be sort of gatekept. Like, you know, yeah. you, you can only be part of this conversation if you have a PhD, or you can only be part of this leadership if you're a baccalaureate prepared nurse with X years of experience. I'm like, D does it really have to be that way? <laughs> like when, when our LPNs and CNAs and, 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 and so many others also just beyond the nursing field going to be included in yeah. some of this work? Yeah, I 100% agree. Like uh, the experience that they bring uh, and the life experience that they bring, think is it, I think it's invaluable. Um, you know, my 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 I always say I always push people for the higher education because I always think uh, I, I'm always going to go back to that default of you are going to be I'm not going to be able to change everybody's mind, right? So there's going to be millions of people out there who are like, well, if you're not this then why am I listening to you type of mentality, right? And even when I got my PhD, one of the reasons I got my PhD was like I said, I never want to be in a position where I'm qualified, but it's that degree is going to keep me from doing it. Does that make sense? So I never want to be at that table and say, oh, but you're you're a bachelor's prepared or you're a master's prepared and I'm sitting around with all these PhDs and DMPs even though I may be the most qualified to have a say so in the topic right so I think that from that perspective the PhD program removes or or any any kind of higher degree it removes barriers and it comes with it like you I know PhD people who aren't <laughs> who probably shouldn't have a, have a have a seat at the table, but at the same time, um, it opens up opportunities and it removes some of those barriers. Um, so then, at that point, it's really up to the individual to say, "Okay, here's how I'm going to be able to contribute based on my experience and knowledge." Uh, I think that's what higher education does, and I think that's 
I, I, I love my ADN to BSN students that I teach. I think they're incredible with the life experience and the work ethics that they bring to the table. Um, but I also appreciate the fact that they've taken that extra step in going back and getting their bachelor's or even their master's degrees or doctoral degrees, because I think um, all that experience, all that knowledge, now you've taken steps to remove barriers. Um, and now we get to hear your voice. Right. There's opportunities for for you to contribute in a way you you may not have been allowed to do before or people were not willing to listen to you before. So I think that's why I always um, I love I, I love our ADN nurses. Um, but I think if they want to see at the table, not only do we have to allow them the opportunities, but I think that higher education removes so many barriers uh, for their voices to be heard. So um, it's like a two ended. We need to work on both ends, right? Um, so I do want to talk. I do want to spend some time talking about uh, some of the things I see you uh, talk about in social media quite a bit, which is um, the, the power dynamics, right? Power dynamics in nursing, power dynamics in 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 um, uh, in in. in uh, how we work with students, how sometimes we try to control students, how academe works uh, among each other. The first time I actually heard about power dynamics was really in my PhD program. I never even thought about power roles till I got into a PhD program and uh, Dr. Georges, who is now the uh, dean of the University of San Diego School of Nursing, uh, started talking about power dynamics, and I never. And then it kind of clicked for me. So now I've looked at look at everything, and whenever you bring stuff up on social media, I'm like, yeah, that that's what that's what that's what I'm talking. About. So I appreciate your voice there. So um, let's talk about uh, you. Um, where do you want to start? Academia. So we actually used the eye tracking technology to measure changes in the function of people's eyes who was uh, who were experiencing fatigue um, not to like diagnose fatigue or to give the insurance companies an excuse not to pay for care related to fatigue but actually just to get to give people a way to make an otherwise often invisible experience that is easily dismissed and gaslighted visible to others um, and, and it was through my engagement with some of those spaces that I ended up protesting to the American Association for the Advancement of Science about the systematic exclusion of nurses and, by extension, patients and caregivers from setting a lot of the innovation agendas in the sort of biotech and mm -hmm. medical innovation world at the time that then got me labeled an invention ambassador, and now suddenly I get to call myself, <laughs> even though we've been doing this all along, suddenly I got to call myself a nurse inventor, and ooh, now suddenly people are like knocking at my door, being like, how do I do innovation? And the more I've thought about it over the last few years or so since all of that transpired, the more I have become convinced, at least in the space of my own work, that, I mean, innovation can mean just about anything under the sun. Um, it's such a widely used term, but if we're talking about impact or transformation in meaningful, lasting ways, then what we really need to do isn't necessarily about a fancy new gadget or a patent or a shiny new process. It's, it's really about redistributing the power over what is happening in the space. And sometimes a device or a tech, techno whatever can maybe help do that. I realize now in our like eye tracking work with our anti-gaslighting technology, we were sort of trying to, to flip the power a bit around people's experiences of, of reporting their symptoms and or having anyone pay attention to that because we know too in the current so-called data-driven world, often numbers are treated with greater weight in many spaces than people's own voices and lived experiences, which are increasingly erased from the health record as well. Yeah. Um, so since thinking about power in the space of 
health innovation and, and how do we do that better, which is, I think, mostly uh, too about, you know, how do we shift power to those who've been excluded from it, whether that's nurses who haven't been involved in decision-making processes or LPNs and CNAs who have not gotten the recognition they deserve to be engaged in those processes. Or, or, or that's literally like talking about scholarship research, device development or design or anything else from the standpoint of equipping the people we actually accompany and care and the ones most likely to be harmed by current power arrangements in society and in the health care space uh, generally e equipping them to be leading that um, and or at least having their expertise in that space recognized um, and once I went down that sort of rabbit hole of thinking all of the ways that we sort of we almost do sometimes sort of performative innovation we do things that say on paper they're supposed to address inequity or injustice, but they're not meaningfully really changing who's in charge and where the power sits. And once I started going down that path, because I never got the pleasure of doing like a, I don't know, a sociology degree or any of the other things that would more meaningfully equip <laughs> someone. But once I started reading like Sarah Ahmed and Rua Benjamin and Sasha Costanza Shock and just these folks who've been doing this work forever, then I couldn't help but like, it's like seeing the matrix. I like started seeing it everywhere, right? Like I see it in, in academia and I see it in, in nursing as a profession and, and in dynamics, as you mentioned, between faculty and students and just that, like it, it's, it's sort of a lens that you can apply everywhere and it's easy to be overwhelmed, I think, when you start applying it and seeing. But then you realize, and I've been humbled to be reminded time and time again, you know, this isn't a new matrix for so many folks. This is my privilege talking that in many of these spaces, too, I haven't had to see it from this standpoint in the past. Um, and, and yet the folks who are most expert in it are often right here and ones who've, who've, who've had to know it just to survive these systems. And um, yeah, that too is, is another space where like power, like, like the fact that academics are asked to opine about these things who are given the power of time to even stop and think and reflect for a moment, like that, that privilege of time to just gather thoughts that is systematically denied, particularly, I think, to the, the, the most, um, the, the clinicians and the community members who are in the most precarious positions and who are taking on the, the load of the burden, because as long as we keep you running and without the time to reflect, you know, much less like plan <laughs> or, or sort of think beyond uh, surviving your immediate circumstances, the easier, the more easy it is to control you. And then when you start to see like everything from nursing curricula to the workflows in the healthcare system from that standpoint of keeping people so pressed, they can't stop to organize and maybe use their collective power to structurally change that whole system, um, the more, I don't know, nefarious it seems. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it is a huge uh, um, thing to take on, especially as you mentioned, if, you know, uh, uh, there's just so many st structural and policy changes and things like that that are in place. And we've been made to feel so much that this is the norm and it's harmless and everybody's sort of having their kumbaya moment <laughs> uh that when you do uh that's kind of what your twitter feeds when i look at your twitter feed that's kind of what it does for me it like sparks something in me and i'm like i have to <laughs> uh, uh, so your twitter feed is my matrix right so 
<laughs> so so that's kind of what I always kind of look at. I'm like, oh my god, I never thought of it that way. And you know, it's you know, especially I know you you uh, mentioned a lot of things with uh, sort of artificial intelligence and monitoring of students with testing and with now in a Zoom world that we're always piercing into everybody's living room and that's one of the things i had to I, I, i'll admit because of what i what you were saying and some of the classes that i took on how to um to be a better better uh better educator um it, it was all on the same page of you know i it took me a long time before i was i, I was okay with not seeing my students in front of me right so they're just a name on a screen that i'm not pe- peering into their living rooms. I'm like, I need to see you. I need to see your eyes. I need to, you know, um, I right off the bat, pretty much, I said up to you whether you want to be on video or not. Uh, But if you're not, it took me probably a good six months before I was like, inside, I was like, I'm okay if you're not there. uh, Or not if you're not there, that I'm not looking at you, which was which was uh, from somebody who likes to teach in person and look at people. It was I think that's the part I had a hard time. Uh, letting go of is because I get so much feedback off of people's faces. And that was, uh, that was no longer, uh, I I need to be okay with that not being available to me. Yeah. Well, good for you. Because I I feel like not everyone has engaged in that level of reflexivity. And it's, it's something I continue to struggle with as well. Because again, I just have my lens. Um, I think another lesson I've taken away from the past year or so and, and and the honor of being in relationship to folks who are also thinking about these things a lot from different standpoints, such as some of the other members of the the nursing mutual aid group, is just having having accountability partners who can reflect back to me too the things that I'm I'm sort of seeing or not seeing or not getting or maybe haven't thought about, including too solidarity around time and boundaries. That, I think that's another space I, I need to do more reflecting on because I used to, to come from a standpoint of wanting to be a helper, wanting to be a pleaser, always striving to be a so-called high achiever. I had been socialized to you know strive for this thing that doesn't actually exist called perfection and, and be really hardworking and burn the candle at both ends and don't sleep at night so that you can get all the things done and volunteer to take this, that, or the other assignment and just, just go, 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 going all the time. And then when somebody would push up against that or be unavailable like over a weekend or not able to take that extra shift or whatever the thing was, I would feel a sort of sense of maybe a little bit of resentment. Like, well, hey, I'm over here burning myself out. Like, why don't you step up the way I am? We're supposed to be, you know, team players. And and I had to be taught, and I'm still working on, on learning this internalized stuff that, like, no, that's again. It's the like, like, the structure has taught me <laughs> to drive for that, and it's one of the ways that we get divided. Like I see divisions in in teams and in units and in academic spaces around questions of labor and equity. But often, if you dig a little deeper, there are questions about boundaries and respect for time and respect for labor and labor being compensated and the folks that I initially, I think my gut reaction was to just be like, you know, what the heck? Like, why, why wouldn't you just step up? Um, especially during this pandemic, it's, it's been a real lesson for me to realize how, if we're really serious about this idea of collective liberation and transforming structures, not just sort of putting band-aids here or there, or, or doing performative stuff that doesn't really result in any meaningful change. Um, a lot of that also has to do with unlearning all of these scripts I've internalized about, again, what is a nurse? You know, a, a nurse might be a helper, but like one of the ways you help sometimes is honoring someone else's boundaries and time. And if they say, no, this is off contract, or no, this isn't you know something within the scope of what I'm able to take on right now. Like, 
accepting that and then if, if the work can't get done within that, now that means maybe there's something about the structure <laughs> that, that needs to change and it's not us fighting with each other about who's more committed and who's yeah. the better whatever because it was never about that. Um, it, it was never a fair game to begin with. Yeah, and that's huge. And I think the whole, um, I hope my bosses aren't listening. Uh, the whole 10 year track <laughs> uh, uh, kind of structure is set up as to make you competitive. Let's see who can do more because that's, here's a prize. Let's see who can do more than the other. Um, and uh, keeps getting higher and higher. And, and then the people who are most needed in the space, the people who's perspectives are the ones absent by design because the yep. space was never created for them, for them are the ones who are pushed out or sort of run over first and we just keep, and then we we sit back and we have committees you know tasked with figuring out like what like what why what's the pipeline issue or what's Reten going on here it's like retention why can't we keep these people the problem? <laughs> <laughs> and i i'm both inspired and depressed by what we've seen over the last year because yeah. I, I've seen spaces where folks have sort of had this consciousness raising and solidarity around issues of like, you know, like th this is the limit of what we can do and we're not going to push folks beyond that and we all need to have some grace and space for just everybody's, just and, and all the invisible labor that so many folks are carrying that never gets recognized. And yet I've also seen that like, we were faced with an overwhelming, absolutely devastating, a disproportionately devastating pandemic during which things literally shut down, like in the sort of wider world, like the whole world, in a sense, paused. And yet we saw that even when faced with that, these systems like academe and the semester schedule and, and nursing and healthcare, like, they would not even pause, much less rest. And that is what we're up against. Yeah. Like, because if that wouldn't stop this sort of train that just keeps grinding on down the track and kind of taking people out with it, I don't know. Like, I, I, what, what's it going to take to to actually reform that and make yeah. it all different? And it was huge. And I see it with some um, faculty across, uh, you know, uh, that I'm connected across the nation. And I see some faculty that are like, no, everything has to be the same. Everything moving forward. What's going to happen if I don't do, if I'm not super strict on APA? And what would happen if I, and I see... And I see this, and I, and I remember my own university said, okay, convert all your classes to online. You have one week. And I was like, what? I was like, this is a fully in-person class. You want me to convert everything in one week? Um, so, you know, I was, I, I'm happy to say I was okay with just taking some stuff, putting it online. And for the rest, I'm like, this is all extra stuff. You don't need to know it. Good luck, you know, like, and just concentrated on what we could do as a group. I'm like, this is, uh, this is not okay. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's strange to see how many people were like, no business as usual. We can't let anybody become a nurse if they haven't had this one chapter of what a, I'm like, you know what? <clears throat> so I have a lot of, uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 I feel like I've, I've seen that too. And I'm, I'm so worried. I shouldn't say worried because worried implies, um, uh, I think, an abdication of responsibility. But I'm I'm very committed to to the extent that I can, not not letting us just fall back to sort of the the old status quo. This is just the way things need to be. Blah blah yeah. blah. Because if nothing else, I mean, just the lessons we've learned around accessibility. And oh, what a yeah, poor you. job nursing particularly has <laughs> always done, always done. And and I'm not saying we're doing it well now, but like the spaces where we've made some gains and actually made it maybe even possible to honor each other's fellow humanity yeah. and see each other as opposed to just grinding down the track no matter what. Like, why would we let that go? We, we cannot afford to let that go. But it's going to take collective action, and particularly among folks, and I include myself here, who do have the, 
I guess, both both unearned power and privilege of maybe being in some of the spaces where these decisions get made to keep pushing and not let up. Um, otherwise, I do see us not only reverting back to the way things were, but also maybe in some cases with with the sort of surveillance ed tech or other tools that, that could actually do even greater harm. And that's just not what we need. We, we, we need to be flexible. Absolutely. 100% agree. Uh, well, I want to be cognizant of your time. I know it's, uh, it's sort of the end of your day, <laughs> middle of mine, end of yours. Um, so uh, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show. Uh, I have a million other questions, so I do hope you are a frequent flyer on the show. I uh, would love to have you back. Um, uh, but before we go, I want to, if you want to add anything else, uh, before we say goodbye for now. Mm. So... I guess I, I didn't do a good job of emphasizing this the other day um, in another public forum where I was speaking, so I'll take the opportunity now that I speak only for myself. I, 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 I certainly cannot speak sort of for others. And I also recognize that in these different structures we just talked about, whether that's ableism or capitalism or white supremacy or settler colonialism or, or any of it, um, the, the, the burden is really incumbent on those who have the unearned power of those systems to, to advocate for and make this change. And um, so I, I, you know, if, if there are folks, maybe new faculty or students or staff nurses or anyone else like hearing some of these criticisms um, and and feeling like they agree but you know their positionality may be very different from mine and I, I certainly don't expect that folks should have to sort of put themselves in further harm's way when they're already experiencing marginalization or harm in these systems to to change them um, but I, I also believe very strongly that if we could have more conversations about the we and how we as as a collective, as nurses or as communities are going to work to, as Dr. Monica McLemore says, make this all different um, <laughs> as opposed to sort of all the individual prescriptions or sort of individual approaches that I also see out there which can be important but are not enough, I think, to move the needle. Um, I hope that we can have more, more conversations of the we, <laughs> being cognizant that the we is, is different, um, and uh, and I, I appreciate your your time and the invitation to talk today. Thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, with that, uh, thank you again. Um, you're 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 a superstar in my book, and uh, I appreciate. Uh, I learn from you all the time. I, I'll admit it. I'll, I learn from you all the time, and I appreciate you putting yourself out there and uh, and uh, talking your piece. Um, so thank you. Uh, we have been listening to Dr. Ray Walker, um, and uh, with that, uh, I want to wish everybody a fantastic rest of your week, and we shall talk again soon. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.